What's going on everybody? Ghost Dragon 1182 here and in this video we are going to discuss 1993's Jurassic Park starring Sam Neill as Alan Grant, Laura Dern as Ellie Sattler, Jeff Goldblum as Ian Malcolm, Sir Richard Attenborough as John Hammond, Joseph Mazzello as Tim, Ariana Richards as Lex, and also starring Wayne Knight, Samuel L. Jackson, B.D. Wong, Martin Ferrero, and Bob Peck. I'm sure you all know it was directed by Steven Spielberg and based on Michael Crichton's novel of the same name. The beginnings of this novel-to-film transition aren't quite as stereotypical as most novel-to-films. Uh, in 1989, before the book was even published, Steven Spielberg and Michael Crichton were actually in discussions over a screenplay that would eventually become the uh, TV show ER. And it was during these talks that Spielberg asked Crichton if he was working on anything new, and Crichton told him about Jurassic Park. Spielberg was fascinated with the idea that the novel was a really credible look at how dinosaurs might someday be brought back alongside modern man, and would be more than a simple monster movie. Crichton had demanded a non-negotiable fee of $1.5 million and a percentage of the gross of the film before the novel was even published. Contenders for the film rights were Warner Brothers and Tim Burton, Columbia Pictures and Dick Donner, 20th Century Fox and Joe Dante, and man what different films we would have got then. Uh, apparently even uh, Jim Cameron was interested in the rights. Uh, he even later stated that uh, Spielberg was the right man for the job, that Cameron probably would have made it more uh, sci-fi and horror, kind of in the veins of Aliens, um, to be closer to the novel adaption, and that probably just wouldn't have worked. Universal Studios eventually acquired the rights in May of 1990 uh, for Spielberg and got the wheels turning. Spielberg had finished Hook and wanted to film Schindler's List first. That film was given the green light though on the condition that Spielberg do Jurassic Park first. So the biggest hurdle that Spielberg had to jump over was he wanted to get the dinosaurs absolutely right. Uh, he first considered hiring Bob Gurr, the designer of the giant mechanical King Kong at Universal Studios Hollywood, and he kind of second-guessed himself when he realized life-size dinosaurs would be too expensive and probably not convincing. So he sought out the best and brightest in Hollywood at the time. Uh, this is where Stan Winston Studios was brought in to create the animatronics for close-ups. And Phil Tippett was brought in to create stop-motion dinosaurs for longer shots. Michael Lantieri was to supervise the on-set effects, and Dennis Murin of Industrial Light and Magic was to oversee the digital compositing. Jack Horner, paleontologist, he was brought in to supervise the designs and help Spielberg realize his vision as dinosaurs as animals, and not just movie monsters. Stan Winston's department created detailed dinosaur models around one-fifth scale, based mostly on the artwork of Mark Crash McQuarrie. Once approved, the models were scaled up into the full-size dinosaurs that you saw in the movie. Phil Tippett, he had filmed a uh, stop-motion animatic of the raptors in the kitchen, which actually this way that he filmed the animatic was heavily criticized by Horner because in the animatic, the raptors were flicking their tongues in and out. Horner just like lost his shit over that, mainly because of the theory that Dinosaurs evolved in the birds, uh, but he did the, an animatic for the raptors in the kitchen scene, uh, Tyrannosaurus walking, and I think like a raptor pouncing at the, t at, at the camera, and despite the advancements in stop motion, uh, they actually called it go motion, uh, they were able to add motion blur and things like that to make it look more realistic. Uh, Spielberg just was not convinced, uh, he, could st he claims he could still see the kind of like the jerkiness to the movements and... He just, he didn't buy it, and he wasn't sure that that was the way to go. It was at this point Dennis Muren made the claim to Spielberg that he believed the dinosaurs could be created through computer-generated imagery, which um, had also made huge leaps in recent years thanks to films like The Abyss and Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Spielberg told him to prove it, and ILM animators started the work. They made a walk cycle for the Tyrannosaurus. They used just a skeleton that wasn't skinned or anything uh, to get the approval. And uh, there was an animatic of a T-Rex skeleton chasing a herd of Gallimimus skeletons. And it was at this point that uh, Spielberg told Tippett, looks like you're out of a job. And Tippett famously replied, don't you mean extinct? Which ended up in the movie as a line between Grant and uh, Malcolm. Tippett and his team were kept on as 
supervisors for the dinosaur movement in the anatomy and his uh his team was retrained from stop motion animation to computer animation his stop motion animatics were also used alongside storyboards for a uh, reference for what would be shot during high action sequences the ilm animators in the meantime went to zoos and animal parks and watched rhinos elephants uh, alligators giraffes basically anything to kind of get the look and feel of uh how animals moved and they even went so far as to take uh, mime classes to help understand natural movements while this was going on Crichton was paid an additional half a million dollars on top of his 1.5 upfront fee to adapt the novel to film this was finished by the time Spielberg was finished filming Hook and due to the length of the novel the script only had less than probably a quarter of what was in the book scenes were eliminated due to budget and practical reasons and a lot of the violence was toned down and I mean toned down the book was gory uh, the book was originally written as like an adventure book kind of like what we got in the film uh, it was written from a child's perspective and just and Crichton couldn't get anybody to pick it up and publish it so you rewrote it into the kind of a more horror sci-fi thing that we got uh, just as an example when Nedry's death occurs in the book he's blinded by the Dilophosaurus but the Dilophosaurus is also about 10 feet tall which they were according to fossil records um, it proceeds to rip open his stomach and he ends up holding his own intestines as he collapses to the ground in pain only to be picked up by his head by the Dilophosaurus with it, his head in its jaws so I mean it's yeah you can see how that stuff went and made it into the PG-13 Steven Spielberg movie Malia Scotch Marmo did a script rewrite in October of 1991 which merged Ian Malcolm and Alan Grant's characters but Spielberg wanted another writer to rework the script it was at this time that David Kep was brought in and started fresh from Marmo's draft inserting the idea of the cartoon explaining how the dinosaurs were cloned which would remove much of the exposition that was in the novel it made the science far more easily digestible to people that weren't into that there was some excessive character detail that was removed uh, Kep felt that the characters started talking about their personal lives and people just wouldn't care but he did try to flesh out the characters more to make the cast more interesting like the moments with Malcolm hitting on Ellie which caused Grant to get a little jealous uh, some characters had their personalities completely changed from the novel uh, Hammond for example was just like this cold callous and sometimes uh, immature type of just like calculating businessman um, he was known for kind of throwing tantrums and screaming and shit like that uh, whereas in the movie he was written as kind of like a kindly old man because Spielberg identified with his uh, obsession for showmanship Tim and Lex had their ages switched mainly because of the casting of Joseph Mazzello who actually had auditioned for the role of I believe it was Jack in uh, Spielberg's previous film Hook and was only turned down basically because he was too young but at the time Spielberg did promise him a role in his next movie so uh, there it is uh, in the novel Tim was the one that got the computer systems back up uh, he was kinda like the nerd um, the techie kid Lex was the one that was in the baseball and all that um, but this was switched in the film um, Lex was given the job of being the computer given the role of being the computer nerd and getting the computer back online towards the end of the film and uh, they kind of threw in that subplot of her having a little bit of a crush on uh, Dr. Grant uh, who him himself was also changed from his novel version in the novel he was a uh, I think he was about 40 years old he was a widower who he loved children in the novel um, to in this movie he was initially hostile to the kids in the film just to kind of give him a character arc talking more about the darkness of the novel one of the things that definitely had to be changed was the opening uh, the opening of the novel was uh, it's pretty fucked up uh, some Procomp Sognathus had made it into the Costa Rican mainland and the novel opens with a uh, an infant being eaten in its crib by the little scavengers uh, that scene was deemed to be too violent and horrific which yeah, it kind of is so the scene was taken out and ultimately it was rewritten into the opening scene in the uh, sequel along with the changing of the opening there was some other scenes that were cut due to the 
previously mentioned budgetary reasons. Uh, getting into the casting aspect of the movie, uh, William Hurt was originally offered the role of Alan Grant, but declined without ever reading the script, as was Harrison Ford. Uh, Sam Neill eventually got the role mere weeks before filming began. Uh, he was later quoted saying, It all happened really quick. I hadn't read the book, I knew nothing about it, hadn't heard anything about it, and in a matter of weeks I'm working with Spielberg. Personally, I think he did a hell of a job with such little time to prepare, but, uh, you know, Neil's a great actor, and I can't really imagine anybody else in the role of Dr. Grant now. Uh, Jim Carrey auditioned for the role of Ian Malcolm, if you can believe that, which, 93, that would have been basically the peak of his comedy career <clears throat> in Hollywood, so bit of a stretch for Carey there, but uh, Janet Hershenson felt that uh, Jeff Goldblum was right and the only actor for the job. She stated that Carey was terrific, but I think pretty quickly we all really loved the idea of Jeff. Cameron Thor had also auditioned for the role before landing the role of Lewis Dodgson. Laura Dern was Spielberg's first choice, um, but Robin Wright was offered the role and subsequently turned it down. Wayne Knight was cast after Spielberg was impressed with his performance in Basic Instinct, going so far as to wait for the credits of the film so that he could write his name down. Uh, Christina Ricci auditioned for the role of Lex, but obviously the role went to Ariana Richards, and I already mentioned how Mazzello got the role of Tim. Filming began on August 25th, 1992, after 25 months of pre-production in Hawaii. The three-week shoot was to involve daytime exteriors for the film's four scenes, but on September 11th, uh, Hurricane Aniki hit the island and caused the loss of a day of shooting. Uh, Spielberg later told a story about how everybody was all huddled in the storm shelters and Richard Attenborough was nowhere to be seen. Uh, when he caught up with him later, he asked him where he was and he said he was sleeping in when Spielberg asked Attenborough how he managed to sleep through a hurricane, he said, My dear boy, I survived the Blitz. The shooting of the Gallimimus chase was moved to a ranch on a different island, and the opening scene had to be filmed on a different island due to this loss of shooting uh, because of the hurricane. Uh, some scenes were... There was about three different islands that scenes were filmed on, and I can't pronounce a single one of them, so... Sorry about that. Uh, there was actually a scene that uh, Samuel L. Jackson was supposed to be involved in where he was being chased and eventually killed by the raptors, but his death scene was never filmed due to the hurricane destroying the set. Universal Studios stages 23 and 24 were used for scenes, and Red Rock Canyon was used for the, uh, the dig site that Grant and Ellie are on when they're introduced in the film. The Tyrannosaurus paddock scene where... The Tyrannosaurus Breaks Out and Destroys the Cars was filmed at a uh, Warner Brothers studio, stage 16. And the filming of the scene caused a lot of frustration for the crews due to the rain involved. Uh, when Stan Winston's team had built the animatronic T-Rex, they were not told that the scene involved rain. When they showed up to film and found out about the rain, concerns were raised because the foam rubber skin of the Rex would absorb the rain which would change the weight of the animatronic. For those of you who don't know how animatronics work, the, they use finely tuned hydraulics to operate and create their movements, especially when you have a... I think that T-Rex puppet was estimated to weigh about 15,000 pounds, somewhere in that area. So when the weight was changed by the skin absorbing the rain, it made T-Rex shake and quiver and some of the movements wouldn't work right. They would have to dry the wrecks off between takes with chamois and blow dryers just to try to get it dried off enough and the weight back down to make it function the way it was intended to function. Um, one of the iconic parts of that scene, <clears throat> the concentric circles rippling in the cups of water on the car's dashboard, was uh, had a little bit of an odd inspiration. It was inspired by... Uh, Spielberg was sitting in his car, listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire, loudly, and the vibrations from the bass in the song made his uh, mirrors shake, and that's where he got the idea that he wanted that in his movie when the T-Rex approached. So Michael Lantieri was tasked with trying to make these concentric circles appear in this cup of water on the dashboard. 
he tried a couple different things and nothing they couldn't get anything to work and he was apparently like sitting at home playing an acoustic guitar and he set the guitar down and took like a sip of water set the water glass on the guitar and just absentmindedly plucked a string and there was his concentric circles so they had to uh, run a guitar string up through the dashboard of the car and then they had somebody lay on the floor of the car and pluck the guitar string to make the circles appear in the water to signal the Rex's approach. Water caused a lot of problems in this movie. Um, one of the other scenes they had a lot of problems with was uh, Nedry's death scene with the Dilophosaurus. Uh, that Wayne Knight was a big dude. Uh, he was about he was over 300 pounds when he filmed that movie. Uh, he had did not like having to kind of roll around and <laughs> climb up that hill with all the water that was rushing down out of there. Uh, they had actually cut a trench in the scene so that the puppeteers could be down inside and they could animate the Dilophosaurus and then the trench started filling up with water. So they had a bit of a difficult time there. Uh, the last element to bring the animals to life was the sound and honestly I mean this is a movie not even getting into how iconic John Williams' score is for this movie. Those are sounds that, first of all, they make these animals sound like animals, but they also sound otherworldly. And, I mean, who... You can take the sound of that Tyrannosaurus roaring or the Velociraptor screeching, and you know immediately what it is. And, I mean, they kind of, like were ingenious about it instead of like synthesizing sounds they just went out and recorded animal noises and combined them uh the t-rex uh, its roar was a combination of a, a baby elephant a tiger and an alligator uh, the velociraptors had vocalizations that consisted of dolphins and geese hissing and uh, walrus bellows uh, <laughs> a little fun fact for you when the first raptor comes into the kitchen and kind of a little barking call to summon the other raptor. That's the uh, sound of two tortoises fucking. Uh, going into the movie itself, uh, the movie opens with uh, some <laughs> a pretty ominous uh, few seconds of music composed by John Williams. And then we kind of pan over some jungle foliage being disrupted by something pretty large. And we see some workers and they're waiting, find out they're waiting for a transport crate to be brought in. Uh, Robert Muldoon, played by Bob Peck, orders the team to push the crate into position while something within snarls and growls at them. Uh, when the workers are ordered to clear away and the gatekeeper is told to open the gate, as he does, the animal inside, which is later revealed to be a velociraptor, charges and knocks the crate back away from the loading door. This gives the raptor enough time or enough space to attack the gatekeeper and as he's being mauled by the raptor the Muldoon tries to save him and there's nothing graphic going on in the scene but the scene works because it follows the kind of psychological effect of less is more uh, by not seeing what the raptor is doing to the uh, the gatekeeper because I mean all we can kind of see is maybe from like his shoulders up um, it kind of lets your brain fill in the rest of that and it makes it pretty scary um, especially if you have an imagination like me the accident results in the board of directors for InGen wanting an investigation done on the park with various scientists being brought in to kind of sign off and give it their endorsal uh, Donald Gennaro the board's lawyer brings in chaotician Ian Malcolm who in the novel was you find out he was present pretty much from the get-go as kind of like a critic of the park um, they sort of hint upon that in the movie but they don't come right out and say it um, there is clearly some rapport between Malcolm and Hammond uh, but they wanted the board wants uh, Alan Grant to be brought in so he gets recruited by Hammond himself with the promise of fully funding his dig and um, Ellie Sattler comes along too. They're brought to the island 
and this is where we get our first glimpse of a uh, full-size dinosaur in the film. Uh, they're traveling across the island in jeeps after being dropped off by helicopter, and the jeeps stop at Hammond's request, and everybody gets like this surprise look on their face, and like, oh my god, you know, and um, just dumbfounded before the camera finally pans up and you see a brachiosaur getting ready to eat from a tree and in 1993 seeing that in a movie theater it blew my fucking mind uh, my 10 year old brain was just like in overdrive at that point because I always loved dinosaurs so seeing something like that and seeing it presented in such a lifelike way that is a feeling or that's a cinematic experience that I will probably never have again in my life uh, the CGI it's held up pretty well over the years uh, and it still looks pretty impressive I mean there's some things you can point out um, especially now as CG has come a long way but uh, you know for a 25 year old movie it looks pretty fucking good the reason I think the CG holds up so well is it's not overdone it's used when it's necessary and what what made it work was they blended that CG with animatronics. You know, when you had the close-up shots, you had Stan Winston's animatronics there. When you had long, wide shots that required the dinosaurs to do things that the animatronic couldn't or had full body shots, those were CGI. Some of the tricks they used, especially like with the Tyrannosaur paddock that makes it work and seem believable, is not only do you have those cuts where you have the animatronic there that puts something physically on set to already get your mind into thinking that that animal is there but when they do CG in a lot of these scenes the lighting's not real good or the lighting's muted it's not bright daylight shots there is a bright daylight shot with uh, the, the Gallimimus Stampede and the T-Rex but for the most part the CG is in either outdoors and it's dark out or low light interiors or muted light interiors you've already seen enough of the animatronic that your mind already processes that that thing is there in the shot and I think that's why the CG doesn't hold up in say Jurassic World as well because they didn't have those animatronics there getting back into the movie after the Brachiosaur scene uh, the characters end up at the visitor center and we get the Mr. DNA animation explaining how they clone the dinosaurs. Uh, Grant, Ellie, and Malcolm aren't completely satisfied with what they're told here and how they get the embryo to grow in the emu eggs and all that. So they lift the uh, kind of the restraining rail on the seats that they're in and they go into the lab and witness a velociraptor hatch upon which time they're go and see the adult raptors in the cage um, when they show up the raptors are being fed and while we the audience don't see what's happening we get to hear it and uh, interestingly enough while filming the scene Spielberg was off camera with like a bullhorn just like making all kinds of weird animal noises and snarls and screeches into the uh, into the bullhorn to kind of get the actors into the into the scene we get reintroduced to Muldoon again, as him and Grant discuss the speed, intelligence, and lethality of the raptors. Uh, we then progress to a lunch scene where the overall principal theme of this franchise gets established. Um, they're debating the issue with Hammond about their apprehension of how irresponsibly the genetic power they have discovered has been used. Uh, Malcolm especially is convinced um, mainly from the get-go, that the park will fail. Uh, after this scene, we get introduced to Lex and Tim, and we kind of get in the Grant's dislike of children a little bit more here. Um, it was established when they were in Montana, but uh, they kind of reintroduced that into the film with the, uh, the presence of the Hammond's grandchildren. Uh, they proceed to go on the tour, and there's a bunch of issues. The Dilophosaurus and the Tyrannosaurus are no-shows. The headlights on the tour vehicles, uh, Ford Explorers, 
uh, in the film instead of the uh, Toyota Land Cruisers that were used in the novel, so they spared some expense. Are running off the vehicle batteries instead of the power grid, and then they come across the sick Triceratops. By the way, the Triceratops was sick because of the West Indian lilac berries. A uh, deleted scene actually explained this, and in the novel it was explained. In the novel it was a Stegosaurus, not a Triceratops, but same scenario. Um, the Triceratops was, they eventually found, and I think in, in the final film you can see Ellie holding one, but the Triceratops would swallow stones for its gizzard. So when it was swallowing these gizzard stones, it would accidentally swallow the West Indian lilac berries, which is why the West Indian lilac berries weren't in dinosaur droppings. So then uh, there's a storm coming. They go back, or Grant, Malcolm, the kids, and Gennaro go back to the vehicles. Ellie stays with the Triceratops and Dr. Harding. Nedry starts the process of stealing the embryos for Dodgson. Um, this is probably, w arguably, one of the best scenes in modern cinema. As Nedry carries on with his plan, the power gets shut off. The tour vehicles stop right in front of the Tyrannosaur paddock. And... What's brilliant about how this scene paces out is it doesn't just, like, hit you over the head with everything. It starts off small. You know, uh, Grant and Malcolm are sitting there just kind of BSing back and forth. Uh, the kids, are obviously, are getting bored, so, like, Tim finds the uh, night vision goggles, and he's messing with those. Gennaro's just kind of, like, dozing off in the driver's seat and they're just killing time waiting for the the power to come back on and the cars to take them back to the visitor center at this point we get the sounds of something large approaching uh, there's impact tremors get the little concentric circles in the water glasses that I mentioned earlier and when Tim looks out the car window with the night vision goggles on the goat's gone. Um, Lex asks, where'd the goat go? And then we get the reveal. The goat leg hits the sunroof of the car, and we get this nice panning shot up through the, uh, the treetops to the T-Rex raising its head up and eating the goat. And Spielberg begins building the tension by showing the fingers of the Rex on the fence. The animal realizing the power is out. Gennaro also seeing this and realizing that there's no power to the fence freaks out, runs off, goes and hides in the bathroom that's near the uh, where the cars are stopped. And then when we go to Grant and Malcolm's car, they're watching Gennaro run away. And then the cables start breaking on the fence and the wreck steps out onto the road. And holy fuck is that awesome! Uh, again, like I said with the Brachiosaur scene, like, seeing that in the movie theater in 1993, like, your mind can't even, like... To this day, that scene still kind of gives me goosebumps a little bit, because it's just like, I remember being 10 years old and seeing that on a movie screen and just being like, holy crap. Uh, especially because my personal favorite dinosaur is the Tyrannosaurus Rex. But uh, she steps out onto the road, makes her presence known in a big way, and just kind of starts middling around, not doing anything at first, just kind of checking out the car that uh, Grant and Malcolm are in. Grant tells Malcolm, don't move, it won't see ya. I'm not gonna get into that whole debate about the Rex not seeing movement. Um, Lex, kind of being in a panic, digs through the supplies in the car, finds a flashlight and turns it on, which draws the animal's attention. It stalks over to their car, at which point Tim jumps into the front seat and closes the door that Gennaro had left open when he fled. 
and this further draws the Rex's attention. He kind of looks around, looks in the car, and as they're trying to shut the flashlight off, it just busts through the sunroof of the car. The scene pays off because it starts with a slow burn. The Rex doesn't come out of the fence and just start destroying shit. It middles around, it, it takes its time. And that's what's one of the things that Spielberg is good at with these movies, and especially a movie like Jaws, is he can build the suspension. And then you combine that with the cinematography, the sound design, and one of the things that really works in this is very rarely are any of the shots involving the T-Rex, like at eye level with the T-Rex, most of the shots are shot from the ground about human height to really show off how big and powerful this animal is and how little we are in its world and it helps establish the sense of scale that just carries through the movie you combine that with having Stan Winston's animatronic which is amazing looking and it the movement of that animatronic even with the problems they had are very they're not a hundred percent like spot-on accurate like there's a couple minor things you could point out but that thing is fluid and it's so believable and even the CG dinosaur feels like it has a real weight to it when it walks um, and one of the things that I always thought was kind of amusing about that scene and I know it sounds kind of fucked up to say this but as the Rex is tearing apart Lex and Tim's car that they're in when Grant realizes they got to do something or these kids are going to die and he finds the flares <laughs> when he comes out of the car and he yells and he's waving the flare and the tyrannosaur roars at him which i love that part too just the way the sound design is there with the echo of the dino the tyrannosaur's roar but he like waves the flare around he's like hey hey, hey. the t-rex roars at him and it the, it cuts back to grant and he just looks like totally clueless like shit now what do i do <laughs> Malcolm tries the same thing but decides to run while holding the flare uh, and the Rex chases him down to the bathroom that Gennaro was in and uh, just destroys the building when it shoves its head through there with uh, Malcolm kind of riding on its snout. Uh, Gennaro just kind of sits there terrified and then he gets eaten. Um, that scene actually a little bit changed from the script uh, because I think the original script had it written the way it was in the novel where... Uh, Malcolm panicked and ran off and got chased down by the Rex and it injured his leg in the novel by it basically picked him up and like dropped him. Uh, Goldblum had the idea of being a little bit more heroic and trying to distract the Rex with the flare to get it away from the car so Grant could get the kids. Um, so that that whole kind of scene played out differently because of uh, Goldblum's suggestion. Uh, it's at this point, uh, Tim has his feet kind of trapped by the, the seat of the car being pushed down in the mud. Uh, but Grant does get Lex out, and the di and the T-Rex shows back up. Um, that's when it starts pushing the car up onto the concrete barrier and over into the paddock. And there's a lot of discrepancies with this scene. I know, I know, because when we get there, the goat is level with the top of the concrete barrier the Rex is basically level with the concrete barrier but then when the car gets pushed over the concrete barrier it gets dropped into like a chasm uh, in the novel and it was mentioned by Hammond that there was concrete moats around every paddock um, the novel's explanation of the moats doesn't really jive with this uh, the way the novel kind of describes it you had the electrified fence and then the the moat was along, like on the inside of the fence on the dinosaur side. And they were anywhere, depending on the size of the dinosaur, they were anywhere from 12 to 30 feet wide. And I think like 15 or 20 feet deep. I forget how deep they were. So there's even a little bit of a discrepancy there in the novel too, because a 30 foot moat, I don't, I think a Tyrannosaurus only had like a, they estimate a stride of maybe like, 15 feet or something like that. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, anyways, 
I did find this image on the internet that I think might actually solve this little dilemma in how this whole scene played out. Uh, there was actually a deleted scene where, or maybe they didn't film it, I can't remember, but it was definitely in the script where as the Rex was attacking the car, it kind of pushed it down the road a little bit past where the goat was. And even in this image, you can kind of see how the car got spun around and moved down the road a little bit. So going by this image, the way the scene plays out is plausible. So then the Rex pushes the car into this drop. Uh, Tim's still trapped inside of it, and the car lands in the tree, and that's the end of that scene. Uh, we eventually get uh, Grant and Lex are down at the bottom of the moat. We'll just call it a moat. Um, Tim's still in the tree, so Grant has to go up and get him and get him down. Uh, as they're getting him out of the... as Grant's getting Tim out of the car. The branches that the car is stuck on start breaking, and as they're climbing down, the car is falling after them, but they make it to the bottom. The car hits the bottom, tips over, but the part of the roof that's missing, when it lands, they are safe. Um, we catch up with Muldoon and Ellie, who had been sent out to retrieve the grandchildren for Hammond. Um... But obviously, by the time they show up, the attack has happened, and the car is gone, and no Grant, no kids. Uh, the scene, this scene, actually reminds me just the way it's lit, and the way between the fog and just the way the flashlights, like the the light shafts from the flashlights, are uh, kind of pretty prominent as they're looking around. Like this scene really reminds me of the scene in Jaws where Brody and Hooper are out on Hooper's boat looking for the shark at night. I don't know, it's just something about the feeling of it and just the way it's filmed and the visuals of it. It just feels like... Um, Spielberg had made a comment that, you know, part of this movie was a kind of a spiritual successor sequel to Jaws. And this scene especially really kind of conveys that notion that he was going for. Uh, but they find Malcolm, his legs injured, and he put a tourniquet on it. They find some bits and pieces of Gennaro, and Ellie finds the other car down in the drop. So they go down there, and um, as they come back, the Rex is coming back too. Ellie and Muldoon get back to the Jeep and take off, and the Rex chases them and Malcolm down the road. And that scene, I mean, yeah, you got the mirror gag, but I mean, that scene's kind of... You know, the first time you see the film, obviously, you don't know who's going to make it out of there live. Um, the scene was pretty tense. I mean, the whole movie has moments like that that are pretty nail-biting. Um, and then they balance it well with some calmer moments and some uh, some lightheartedness here and there. Then you kind of get this quieter scene with Grant and the kids up in the tree and getting ready to just get some sleep for the night and segues into the scene with... Uh, Ellie and Hammond sitting down and you know, Hammond's eating the ice cream and they have their whole discussion about how, you know, Hammond, once they fix the mistakes they made, then they'll get this park working and going and Ellie basically points out that they never had control from the get-go. And again, like, there's important information and dialogue in that scene, but it's a quieter, more laid-back scene. And it's these calmer moments that kind of give you that nice little roller coaster ride for the film. Because um, after that, then we get the scene where uh, Grant and the kids wake up and there's a herd of brachiosaur feeding nearby, and one is uh, eating from the tree that they're in, and you know they feed it and it grossly sneezes on Lex. I mean, I, 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 no. one of my things is I can't stand snot. I can watch movies where people get disemboweled all day long. I can't do snot. That scene just fucking grosses me out. Um, they find dinosaur eggs in the wild with Grant theorizing that uh, the frog DNA that was being used to fill the gene sequence gaps uh, enabled some of the species of dinosaurs to uh, spontaneously change sex in the same sex environment and reproduce, thus proving Malcolm to be right that life finds a way. Uh, Muldoon, Hammond, Ellie, and Malcolm, and Samuel L. Jackson's Ray Arnold are discussing shutting down the system to reboot the computers. 
Uh, Arnold's not in favor of it because he can't guarantee the systems will start back up. Muldoon mentions the lysine contingency, but Hammond wants nothing to do with that. Uh, he's still kind of stubbornly showing that he refuses to give up on his dream of Jurassic Park or his idea of Jurassic Park. Arnold finally reluctantly shuts down the power, turns it back on, or shuts down the system and turns it back on and everything reboots from start. But they got to return, or they got to reboot the, or restart the generators and everything like that, which would require somebody to go out to the maintenance shed. Uh, we cut back to Grant and the kids walking through the park. They stumble across a stampeding herd of Gallimimus in a field, and just watch this scene because it's a, yeah, there's no point in describing it. It's just amazing that 25 years ago this scene was created with all that's in this scene is three actors and a fuckload of CGI. Rise there. No, Just no. keep. Tim. Tim, can you tell me what they are? The yeah, uh, 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 gala, uh, gala mice. Are, are those meat-eating uh, meat sources? Changes just like a flock of birds evading a predator. They're uh, they're flocking this way. So then after that, we go back to Ellie, Muldoon, Malcolm, and Hammond discussing why Arnold hasn't returned. Uh, Ellie decides she's going to go to the utility shed. Muldoon offers to go with her. And while they're walking to the shed, they discover the raptors have broken free uh, because the shutdown shut down all of the systems. Um, and one of the things that I think that's overlooked in this film, and as I mentioned earlier about you know the whole like kind of spiritual successor to Jaws, Muldoon is very much like Quint from... Jaws. Uh, he has a strong hatred for the raptors. He's lost people to the raptors and he wants them destroyed. He just absolutely despises these animals. And due to circumstances, he finds out, you know, him and Ellie are being hunted. He tells Ellie to run to the shed while he remains because he thinks he has the situation under control, refusing to believe otherwise, much like Quint. Uh, goes into the forest to hunt the raptor that is hunting them down and like Quint his overconfidence eventually leads to his own demise during all that though Grant and the kids are climbing the, they reach the perimeter fence uh, they have to climb over to get to the other side and you have three things going on at the same time here which just adds to the stress levels um, when you're watching this film you got the kids climbing the fence you got Grant and the kids climbing the fence Ellie's restarting the park systems, and Muldoon's playing cat and mouse with a raptor. So, as the kids are climbing the f Grant and the kids are climbing the fence, Ellie's starting up each individual system one by one after she turns the main breaker back on. And at the very bottom, clearly labeled perimeter fence, so you know she has like 15, 16 buttons. She's got a her breakers she has to flip back on before she gets to that one. So it's cutting back and forth between her turning on switches, Grant and the kids climbing in the fence, the alarm comes on, the, the power is on, and this fence could turn on at any minute. <coughs> uh, Tim kind of panics and loses his footing, and then kind of just like freezes a little bit, doesn't want to, you know, I mean, he's a little kid. Um, as Grant's trying to coax him down, 
you know, we go back to Ellie, turning on more switches before finally she turns the perimeter fence on, shocking Tim. He gets thrown from the fence, and he's not breathing. And before you even get a time to process that, Ellie's attacked by a velociraptor in the shed, which leads to her discovering Ray Arnold's severed arm. Uh, she makes a beeline for the exit with the raptor chasing her. Um, so finally, you know, she gets out, she locks, or she closes the door with the raptor inside the shed. Uh, cut back to Muldoon hunting the raptor that was hunting them. Uh, we know how that turns out. Then we go back to Grant and the kids. Grant's performing CPR and Tim and finally gets some breathing. Like, this is the kind of stuff, it's like, Jesus, this, there's times where this movie is just relentless. Um, but... Tim starts breathing again. They go back on their way. Uh, they finally return to the visitor center. A little quiet moment there. Just to kind of ease you back down. But we're heading towards the end game, or the end of the movie, so we're going to be ramping back up here. Grant goes off to find the others. The kids are left in the visitor center. Raptors show up. <laughs> so then we get the kitchen scene, where the kids go hide in the kitchen to avoid the raptors. And we start seeing the the intelligence of these animals as one of the raptors figures out how to open the door and call in its pack mate over and they start stalking through the kitchen. And, you know, watching it and talking about it, like, I never realized how unrelenting this movie is. Probably because I've seen it so, so many times, I'm kind of, like, desensitized to it in a way. You know, because I know what to expect now, but Jesus... Like I said, I mean, there's times where this movie just does not let up. Those raptors stalking those kids to the kitchen, that's got to be one of the most suspenseful and terrifying things in a film ever. I mean, it's it, it's definitely up there. Uh, but the kids, you know, they, through various means, trick the raptors into kind of... The one runs into the steel, like, uh, cupboard or whatever you want to call it. When it thinks it's getting lax, uh, Tim locks one in the freezer. They get out. They get reunited with Grant and Ellie. And then uh, they go to the control room. And we kind of just blast through that. And talking about that control room scene, one of the criticisms I see a lot is that you know, while the raptor's trying to get into the door and Grant and Ellie are trying to hold the door shut against the raptor, Tim's just like freaking out while Lex is on the computer trying to get the systems started up. People are like, why didn't Tim give Grant the gun, or blah, 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 blah. Listen, this kid's like nine years old, maybe? I don't know, ten? Tops? He was in a car that was attacked by a Tyrannosaurus Rex, thrown into a tree, had the car that he was in when he got thrown into the tree, fall after him while he's trying to get out of the tree. They... Barely survived us running through a stampeding herd of Gallimimus. He was electrocuted and thrown from the fence. That's a lot for anybody to go through, let alone a kid. His mind isn't going to process, I should pick up that shotgun and hand it to one of those adults so they can try shooting that dinosaur on the other end of that door. It's just not going to work. I mean, I, I to me, it's... I don't think it's much of a much there to criticize. He's panicking. He doesn't know what to do. Lex gets the systems booted up, the door locks. Hammond, or, uh, Grant calls Hammond, tells him to get a chopper. Let's get out of here. The phones are back on. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, the raptor tries breaking through the glass to get into the control room. Grant shoots at it a couple times. How he missed, I don't know. Um, I would assume, maybe, because it was slugs instead of buckshot or whatever, but regardless. Uh, they go up into the drop ceiling to get out of there, uh, eventually making it to the main area of the visitor center where they are boxed in by two velociraptors, the one from the control room and then the one that was outside that managed to get out of the uh, utility shed. Doesn't look good for our heroes in this moment, and the ending of this was actually changed uh, originally, it was either one of the raptors was going to get killed by the skeleton falling on it, and then Grant was going to use one of the construction cranes or something like that to kill the other one. Um, 
but Spielberg realized very quickly that people were going to love the Tyrannosaurus and they were going to love the Velociraptors. So he kind of felt like, actually originally in the script, the Tyrannosaurus was going to die kind of similar to how it died in the novel. Uh, but he changed the ending to have the Rex kind of be the hero of the day there with following the raptor in through the opening of the visitor center that hasn't been finished and killing the raptors. Um, ironically, watching this again to make this video, I never noticed that as that raptor is getting ready to pounce at Grant and the kids, you actually see the shadow of the Rex on the floor before it grabs the raptor in its jaws. So I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> And I don't know how I never noticed that before. So, they get off the island, and you have your nice, quiet, happy ending. Um, all in all, I mean, it, it's, it's a film that deals with the theme of man playing God, using genetic science to do things that they don't fully comprehend. Like Malcolm said, they were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they never stopped to think if they should. And, you know, we're not meant to tamper with the natural world in such a way, and... The repercussions of this tampering can be catastrophic. And that's what the theme of these movies are. Um, later installments I've seen, especially with uh, Fallen Kingdom, one of the criticisms, not enough dinosaurs. The movies aren't really about dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are kind of set dressing for the theme of everything that's going on here. I thought the acting was pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, we got some big names in there. Um, people that would go on to be highly recognizable later on in their careers. Um, Sam Neill's always somebody I liked, uh, even though he's not like a blockbuster guy. Um, but everybody in this movie, you know, played their roles so well that for them, I mean, I can't really imagine anybody else in those roles. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum kind of hammed it up here and there, but it created some memes for us for the next 25 years. But, I mean... He was good in the movie. He, uh, to the point where, you know, Crichton's next novel completely retconned the fact that Malcolm died in the novel. Grant's arc of kind of initially being abrasive towards the kids and then eventually becoming a willing protector. It feels organic. It doesn't feel forced. Um, he's in a situation where, even though he doesn't really like kids, he's human. You know, it's, he... he once he doesn't want them to die, obviously, so he goes out of his way to try to save them and ensure their safety and eventually bonds with them. And it changes him. And that's I think that's what one of the things that really pisses me off about Jurassic Park 3 and pissed a lot of people off about Jurassic Park 3 is all that character development that Grant made in that first movie. And even the, the development between him and Ellie, like none of that's there in Jurassic Park 3. The visuals, well, maybe... To this day, the CGI might not be as mind-blowingly awesome as it was in 1993. It's still pretty solid. Uh, it's still something worth seeing on a big screen. Uh, if they ever, there's talks that there's going to be a 25th anniversary re-release. I mean, if you get the chance to see this in a theater, go see it in a theater. It's that's the kind of movie it is. That's something that you have to see on that giant fucking screen. Um, the dinosaurs, you know, well, not scientifically accurate, you know. They went with the information they had available when the time that, you know, the movie was made. Yeah, the Velociraptors are enormous, but there was a lot of debate. Well, there wasn't a lot of debate. But the sources that Crichton used for his research when writing the novel, at the time, Deinonychus were classified as raptors. And, I mean, in the novel, it's pretty clear, knowing what we know now and even knowing what we knew then, that these were um, Deinonychus, not actual Velociraptors, um, even though they're still technically a little bit big for uh, Deinonychus. And it's a movie. It's not like this isn't a Discovery Channel special about the about dinosaurs roaming the earth or anything like that. As far as the message that the movie is trying to get across, that's what these animals serve that purpose, you know. Um, the film has, I think, probably one of the more perfect balances between high tension, uh, suspense, terror, moments of nice calm and quiet, character development, 
and it just kind of all comes together in this nice little two-hour package of awesomeness you know i mean and let's be honest i mean who hasn't seen jurassic park by now i mean you have to have been living in a cave um but i've loved this film since i was 10 years old and not just because i'm, I'm a dinosaur not because i truly feel that this is a great film at its core it's you know this franchise has had complaints leveled at it about like i said the scientific accuracies but taking away the scientific inaccuracies that have been pointed out at length you know the story serves the purpose it's supposed to serve. Mankind meddling with things that they do not understand and the consequences of those actions. So, all I'm going to say, sit back, grab some snacks, and watch this movie. I mean, there's a reason it's on the 1001 movies you must watch before you die. That's all I'm saying.